Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, it's Josh, and today we are doing a long overdue, much requested follow-up on what is probably the most popular among all my watches, among all of you all, the Japan Domestic Market, or JDM, Seiko SARX 055. This is one of the models that's commonly known as the Baby Grand Seiko Snowflake, or sometimes just the Baby Snowflake. So right now as I'm filming this, it is January of 2021, and I have had this watch now for about two years. I bought it pretty early on in 2019, and I did a couple of videos when I first got it, but I don't ever think I did a one-year follow-up as I usually do, and a lot of you have been asking, like, what I think two years in. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, at the time, I was also pretty new to YouTube as well, and even though this is still just a hobby for me, um, I think that my videos have gotten a lot better since I started and definitely since then. And a number of you have asked if um, I could do an updated video on this guy with kind of the new lighting, the new setup, the higher production quality that um, some of you have noticed in my videos more recently. And by the way, I'm glad you all have noticed because that means I'm at least doing something right. So anyway, that's what we're going to do today. And right off the bat, I want to just launch in by answering kind of the most common question I get about this watch. And I still get so many comments even two years after the fact about this watch from all of you guys and messages over on Instagram. And that is, do I still have this watch and do I still feel like it's as special as I made it seem in my original videos? And to answer that, absolutely. I... This is one of the most special watches in my collection, regardless of price point. This is such an incredibly special watch, you guys, and I get so much joy and just pleasure out of using this and pulling it out of my watch box every time I get the chance and I feel like it's appropriate to pull it out and put it on my wrist for the day. It just brings so much light and so much joy, literally light, to my day as I'm wearing it. And so now let's talk about why. Now, in my opinion, the first and most important thing you have to know about this watch is that despite it's under a thousand dollar US price tag, I really feel that it can hold its own against watches twice its price, even three times its price. This is a prime example of what Seiko does so incredibly well. Some of y'all will disagree with me here, but in this price class, I think most people, myself included, are going to prioritize the overall fit and finish and finesse over the movement inside. And although the 6R is a fantastic movement from Seiko, the fit and finish here is really what stands out and sets this guy apart. It's just so incredibly well done. Even people who are not part of our world, so to speak, recognize that this is something special. And I think that says a lot about what Seiko has crafted here. Now, when I first got this watch, I have to say, like many of you, I was really on the fence about the titanium case and the bracelet. Not because of its weight. I actually really, really like the weight because it's super light and it makes it really comfortable to wear. But what was kind of an acquired taste was the way that the titanium here is a little bit more dull. It's a little bit more matte than the stainless steel versions of these watches. And I will say it definitely could be a deal breaker for any of you who love the luster and the shine of stainless steel and only intend to wear this as a dress watch. I might definitely think twice if I were you in that situation. But for me, in my wear of the watch and what I wanted to get out of it, I've actually come to really appreciate and really like the fact that it isn't as bright and shiny as stainless steel for two reasons. First, I hardly ever wear actual formal wear like a proper suit or a tuxedo. I work in the design department of a tech firm, and so even to work on the most formal days, I'm really just wearing something like a blazer or a sports coat with chinos. And in that context, to me, the subtle luster here allows me to pair this watch with even the most casual ensembles, which makes it so versatile. This goes with everything from, you know, formal attire all the way down to things like jeans and a white t-shirt and sneakers. And secondly, getting back to fit and finish, I really, really like how the darker, less lustrous titanium allows the mirror polished bits to stand out. We have these accent links here on the bracelet. Then we've got things like the super finely cut indices, the hands, and the super fine polish polishing on the case. It really makes that contrast pop. And before we move on, I just want to spend a moment and talk about these indices because if I had to name a favorite feature of this watch, it would be these indices. They just make the entire watch for me. The chamfered edges here are so beautifully done. They are so sharp. They are machined so finely. And they almost take on the form of a little crystal in the way that they dazzle in contrast with, again, both the titanium and this kind of more rough and organic texture on the dial. It's enchanting is probably the best way I can describe it. 
Now, that's not to say that the dial itself is not stunning as well, because it absolutely is. But something I get questions on, and that I always feel the need to mention, is, in my opinion, the way people refer to this and the SARW041 as baby Grand Seiko snowflakes is slightly misleading because the actual Grand Seiko Snowflake is quite different in that the dial is definitely white and definitely matte, where the dial here is definitely silver and actually has a semi-gloss layer over top. And I think that some people end up being disappointed if they've seen the real Snowflake, which is sold here in the States, and then buy this thinking that it's going to have the same overall effect or the same kind of dial. The way that the two dials are crafted between the actual Grand Seiko and this guy is really, really different in that the Grand Seiko looks like it was chiseled by hand. It looks really finely crafted, really organic, and this dial in comparison to me has always looked like it could have been cut from a larger wafer or something like that. But again, we have to remember that that Grand Seiko is about six times the price of this watch. So that's kind of to be expected in my opinion, and you just have to set your expectations accordingly. Now the other thing that I get questions about in terms of fit and finish and it's kind of overall polish is how it wears over time or how it has worn for me in terms of the titanium which is of course a softer metal and the dial which one might think could be more fragile than let's say a glass dial or a brushed metal dial. And I haven't had mine again for a very long time in the bigger scheme of things, but I do wear it quite frequently and I am, as many of you are frequently <laughs> appalled by, quite rough on my watches. So I think I've gotten a pretty good picture of what the average wear will look like for the average person. Um, and overall, I think it has held up quite well. Honestly, the most notable wear on my watch is actually on the polished surface on the left-hand sidewall of the case, which is partly because I tend to set my watches down standing upright, but also because I always stack my watches with some kind of bracelet or other jewelry item on my wrist, and so quite frequently there is, you know, stone on metal or metal on metal, and I know that's appalling to some of you guys, and I, <laughs> like... I mean, sorry, but not sorry. I just think that, you know, all of my watches, but this one in particular, looks so good when you start stacking them with different bracelets and you coordinate your entire ensemble. And let me just say, in case you're new to my channel, I'm just not precious with any of my watches, whether they be $100 or $10,000. And if, it, if that offends you, I totally understand. I'm just not the YouTuber for you in that case. So I'm just going to leave it there. And going back to the dial, I haven't seen any change at all, which honestly doesn't surprise me. Most watches these days, short of like a diver with an aluminum bezel like a Tudor, aren't going to patina in any real noticeable way. You're not going to get any color change or finish change or anything like that, at least not within the first couple decades of owning this watch, so I wouldn't worry about that. Some of you have also asked about the crystal because, as you might know, we do have a couple layers of AR coating on the outside to achieve that almost invisibility that this crystal seems to pull off. And I can say with quite a bit of confidence that having brushed this guy up against a couple of concrete walls at my office, I don't see the AR coating deteriorating or coming off or chipping or peeling in any way, shape, or form, so no damage to report there. In terms of movement and mechanical performance, I have had absolutely no problems thus far, though in general I find Seikos that are made in Japan to be super solid in terms of both initial quality but also long term durability and reliability. I've also been quite pleased with accuracy of this specific watch. This guy has been running at around plus or minus five to six seconds per day consistently whenever I measure it. Now, I'm not super anal about accuracy, meaning I don't go and measure this guy every single week to make sure it is still running at that, but I will say that the five or six times in the two years I've measured it, it has returned very consistent, very accurate results, so I'm happy with that. But because Seiko regulates their movements by machine, there is often a big variance, even between individual watches of the same model and movement, so your results may vary. That said, the 6R can be regulated by a good jeweler to run near or within the COSC spec. So if you get yours and it is kind of closer to Seiko's stated rating, I would just go and find a good jeweler to re-regulate and fine-tune it for you. And finally, the last thing I want to leave you guys with is, though it's not specific to this watch, for 99% of us, this will need to be imported through someone like, say, a Japan, which is where I got mine. And if you don't know what that means or what comes along with importing a JDM watch, it might not be the purchase for you. 
More importantly, though, as of late 2020, Seiko is no longer providing international warranty cards with Seiko watch purchases made in Japan, which is essentially what companies like Seiya Japan have to do. They purchase it from a retailer in Japan, and then they export it to you. And so what they get, and thus what you get, is that new Japan market certificate of guarantee only valid in Japan. So it'll probably be considerably harder, if not totally impossible, to get warranty coverage in your home country where before, I think you could generally try to convince them that you bought the watch while on holiday in Japan or something like that, and maybe they would cover it. So if you are looking at this guy, that is something that you definitely have to take into consideration now with this new rule. So anyway, you guys, that's all I've got for today. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate it, as always. I hope this was helpful for any of you who were on the fence or looking at picking this up. I hope for those of you who had requested the two-year follow-up that this is what you were looking for. Anything I didn't cover, any questions you might have, leave them down in the comments below. I do, as always, try to get back to you all as quickly and as thoroughly as I can. With that, Happy New Year, guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care, and I will talk to you guys soon.